Our first scripture reading is an epistle reading. It's from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians, chapter 6, verses 12 to 20. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are beneficial. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach, and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is meant not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord, and will also raise us by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Should I therefore take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never! Do not... Ooh, sorry. Do you not know that whoever is united to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For it is said, the two shall be one flesh. But anyone united to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Shun fornication. Every sin that a person commits is outside the body, but the fornicator sins against the body itself. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you were brought, for you were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Well, our second scripture reading today is from the Gospel according to Saint John, and we read beginning in the first chapter, verse forty-three. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, "Follow me." Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph, from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. May God add blessing to the reading of his holy word. Let's pause for a moment of prayer. O gracious and loving God, we come to you again today, just as we are. God, each of us, every day, experiences joys and difficulties of different kinds, but we give you thanks that you are always with us. And when we gather to worship you, you are with us in a special way, filling us with your presence, working through each other, each of us to bless each other and to to build each other up so that we can do what you've called us to do. Fill us with grace as we meditate upon your word today. Fill us with the wisdom we need. We humbly ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, after hearing the doorbell ring, an exhausted mother opened the front door of her home. Outside stood the young minister of a nearby church who said, Good morning, ma'am. I'm collecting donations for a new children's home that we're building. I hope you'll give what you can. The beleaguer mother replied, "Uh, I'll give you two boys, two girls, or one of each. (laughs) Well, you know, too much of most things in life, including that wonderful time we share with our children, it can get overwhelming. Too much of anything. And the same thing is true these days about trying to keep an open mind to new or different ideas. 
Why? Well, one reason is the enormous amount of information most of us receive from different sources, different angles, every day. All of this information continuously bombarding us gets overwhelming at times. And what do many of us do when we get overwhelmed? Well, naturally as a way to feel protected and comfortable, we tend to become guarded, uh, to close up. And this can include closing our minds rather than keeping them open. See, according to experts, people on Facebook alone share 500 million stories each day. It's a lot of stories. And folks have made 2.5 trillion posts to date. 2.5 trillion. That's a huge number. I mean, the only thing bigger than that number is the amount of money the federal government spends. <laughs> but uh, those, uh, those statistics about Facebook, they don't even include information shared on Instagram, Pinterest, YouTube, Twitter, LinkedIn, WhatsApp, Snapchat, TikTok, I don't know, knick-knack, patty-whack, give your dog a bone, who knows? There's so many other social media platforms that exist out there, not to mention websites and television outlets. So, in many corners of our culture today, it's not surprising that with this daily deluge of information, many people are closing their minds. You know, from all of the information they're receiving, Folks are selectively choosing a narrative, is what uh, philosophers and others call it. A narrative, one rigid way of viewing the world socially, politically, economically, yada, yada, yada. And, and then developing an I'd agree with you, but we'd both be wrong attitude toward anyone with another opinion. Even if there's evidence that contradicts some aspect of the narrative that a person's chosen, that can even be overlooked or swept under the rug. Someone, for instance, chooses to believe that there's a hobbit living under their house because they saw some video on YouTube made by some nut claiming to be an expert on the present day hobbit invasion. So someone else visiting the person's home might suggest that perhaps it's a woodchuck or a mole making the noises that they've heard under their, their uh, house. But that doesn't fit into the whole Hobbit narrative, you see. So that option can't even be considered. Now those with a closed-minded mentality often don't care to even discuss other viewpoints with anybody who disagrees with them because everybody else is wrong anyway. Now, it used to be that the only one like this was mean old Uncle Gib, who sat over in the corner at family gatherings. You know, he, he always, all, always already knew everything, and everybody else was wrong. So the solution was just to smile at Uncle Gib as he mumbled on, and, and when he finished, you know, tell him that you loved him and give him a great big hug, hoping that he might smile. That's what closed-mindedness looked like, used to look like, but now, now you've got all sorts of people acting like this. Young people even acting like mean old Uncle Gib, a completely closed-minded, it's, it's crazy, I, I could have never imagined. Uh, and, and some of these folks attempt to use channels of power to force their viewpoints upon others. Uh, they can involve uh, working through our political systems to force legislation without compromise into law. Uh, it can involve stalking people with unfavorable opinions on the internet by sending nasty or threatening 
messages to them. It's called trolling others on the internet. Uh, it can involve burning down buildings, beating people in the streets, or breaking into federal buildings, or any other number of ways that close-mindedness compels people to impose their viewpoints on others. Whatever those viewpoints happen to be, whatever ideology they come from. And this, for obvious reasons, it causes problems in our society. It's causing problems in our society. But thankfully, as Christians, we don't have to live this way. We don't have to respond to the daily influx of information by closing our minds because what our faith teaches us about who we are, the meaning of our lives, the existence of our eternity beyond this world, it's so amazing that it casts a bright, beautiful light upon everything else in this world that puts everything else into its proper perspective. I mean, we have a faith that teaches us that from before we were even born, to the grave, to the paradise that awaits us beyond this world, we serve a God who loves us, who died for us, and who's guiding us through all the complexities and hiccups of this life, working out his eternal plans for us. And embracing these beautiful beliefs that frees us. It frees us from clinging too tightly to this earthly opinion over here or this particular worldly idea over there. Enabling us then to keep the kind of open mind that allows us to learn from others that we might disagree with in peaceful productive ways that end up benefiting everybody. It's beautiful what our faith can free us to do. You see, that was what St. Paul's concern was in our epistle reading that Ethan read for us today. When he starts out saying, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are beneficial. And then he goes on to describe some of the practices that were going on in, in other temples uh, in Corinth at the time. Other temples that had uh, uh, ideas that were limiting people's ability to, to follow Christ. And, and Paul encouraged them to, to move away from those things. He was concerned that these early Christians were setting aside some of these basic truths and, and that would have torn the foundation of their new lives in Christ right from under them. Because it's those core beliefs in Christ that anchor us in a tumultuous world. And that's what gives us the freedom to enjoy relationships with people who think very differently from us, uh, enabling us to share Christ's love and grace with them. And the best example of this is Jesus himself in the Gospels. You know, Jesus never burned a book with his followers. Uh, he never banned a book with his followers because Jesus was interested in discussing ideas with people. We read in the Gospels about how many official religious authorities in Jesus' day who had this narrative or were locked into this narrative over here, how they frequently harassed Jesus. But what's interesting is with all this harassment, we never read about Jesus saying to his followers, for instance, you know, oh no, you guys, look at that. 
There's a group of those morons over there. Let's take this other path so we can avoid talking to them. Better yet, let's go burn down their homes when they're not looking. Uh, no, you know, the reason why there are so many stories of Jesus arguing with people in the Gospels is because he chose to walk right into the middle of those discussions uh, to teach others basic spiritual truths that made it possible for them to open their minds when it came to other issues that they were concerned about. So many leaders in his society and people were being driven by uh, political issues related to the Roman Empire and this thing and the other thing. And Jesus was trying to free their minds by helping them focus on what really mattered. And that's exactly what he does with a man named Nathaniel in our Gospel reading today. Um, we don't know much about Nathaniel outside of this passage, but this passage is part of St. John's account of the way that Jesus called his first disciples to follow him. And it involved Jesus slowly building relationships with these guys while he was ministering in the seaside town of Capernaum. And like many Jews in their day, Jesus' disciples-to-be, they were keeping their eyes out for a Messiah. Someone who would liberate them from their currently miserable existence under Roman rule. And in our story, Philip, who's decided to follow Jesus... He talks to one of his friends named Nathaniel about this. And he says in verse 45, We have found him about whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote. Jesus, son of Joseph, from Nazareth. To which Nathaniel, he initially replies, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? I mean, that's a pretty close-minded statement, if you ask me. Uh, not to mention that it's just rude. You know, it's like saying today, you know, oh, you know, he's from Steinsville, Indiana, that dump. You know, it's just snotty. And In fact, Nathaniel was fortunate that nobody from Nazareth uh, besides Jesus was standing near him when he said that, uh, especially somebody with really big muscles and a short temper. But uh, as close-minded as Nathaniel's comment was, which uh, likely reflected other viewpoints in his life, Jesus looks on the bright side of the situation. And he says, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. In other words, this is a guy who certainly wears his thoughts on his sleeve. And uh, Jesus' light-hearted, loving response, it begins to open Nathaniel's heart and mind. You know, it's not unlike giving mean old Uncle Gib a hug and a kiss on the cheek at that family gathering. And, and Nathaniel, who, who hadn't met Jesus before, he asks, where did you get to know me? Realizing that Jesus already knew more about him than he thought. Which gives Jesus the opportunity to begin to get to know Nathaniel even better. And, and through the process, somehow revealing to him uh, the basics of what he needed to know. Opening his eyes to what really mattered. Which, uh, for Nathaniel, you know, realizing this, uh, that Jesus is the Messiah... He declares in verse 49, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. And compare that statement to his initial statement. It's like night and day. You know, placing our faith in Christ, as Nathaniel does in this passage, and embracing everything that that means, it does give us the freedom to live with open minds toward others so that we can relate to them, get to know them, whether they agree with us or not about everything. And as we do so, genuinely share the same love and grace that Jesus shared with Nathaniel. 
Our faith makes it possible for us to remain secure in ourselves, in our eternity, without having to, as I mentioned before, trying to find that security, trying to, to find uh, you know, that, that solace in this earthly opinion over here or, or this thing over here, uh, opinion about politics over there, so that unlike too many people in our society today, we can truly transform people's lives and eternities for the better. Not through force, not through trying to impose our viewpoint on others, but through genuine relationship. So our passages today, they challenge us to ask ourselves, clinging unswervingly to my faith, do I have the courage to open my mind when I'm with other people, when it comes to other things, learning with them, growing with them, and sharing God's eternal grace with them. In the process, imagine how the, the culture, the nature of our society would change if this was everyone's priority. Amen.